commissioners, um, are there any questions about any items on our agenda for the briefing meeting? And are there any questions about any items on the agenda for our five o'clock meeting this evening? Commissioners, I placed an item at your plate. I'd like to know if we can add that to the agenda at five o'clock by consensus. It is another good news story. Sure. I think we can add this by consensus. All right, then um, if there's no other questions or additions, then we will follow the um, agenda as published for our briefing meeting today. And um, let's get started. There will be an, um, a COVID update from Stacey Saunders. Good afternoon, and thank you all again for the time today um, to present our COVID update. So Buncombe County has um, surpassed 30,000 total cases of COVID-19. As of yesterday, uh, we have 30,384 confirmed cases of COVID-19 since identifying our first case. In addition, we now have lost 440 neighbors in COVID-related deaths. That's 440 individuals that um, we will all miss this holiday. And so uh, just as I'm addressing you and the community, as folks finish their holiday shopping and enjoy the twinkling lights of the season, uh, please take a moment to remember these 444 people in our community that have died during the pandemic. And remember them not as just a number, uh, but as friends and neighbors um, that they truly were. Unfortunately, I do not bring tidings of good cheer today uh, for you all um, in terms of our local numbers. Case rates, transmission rates, and hospitalizations are increasing. We are now seeing the impact of the recent holiday travel and gatherings um, as we are about 10 to 12 days out from many of the Thanksgiving festivities. Our case rate has increased over 54% um, in the last week, rising to 208 new cases per 100,000. In the last week, that's almost 590 new cases um, that were identified. Just a couple of weeks ago, um, we were celebrating dropping below 5% positivity. As of yesterday, we are now sitting at 6.6% .6 positivity. Deaths have not changed significantly um, in the last week with three new deaths entering the dashboard. However, hospitalizations within the local hospital system continue to rise. While they are still low, we have seen this um, rise from 2.8% of inpatient beds occupied by COVID-19 just prior to Thanksgiving to almost 5% as of Monday. And based on today's daily census, that percent will further increase as there were just under 70 inpatient beds occupied with COVID-19 hospital-wide versus 33 just before the holiday. ICU utilization remains stable at this time. So after spending a few days in the substantial spread status on the CDC tracker, North Carolina has re-entered the high spread status and the CDC still considers Buncombe County an area of high transmission. I can't um, honestly say that I'm surprised uh, by the indicators. We were anticipating cases um, to further rise after the holiday. Our current epi curve is showing, um, showing that rise to the far right if you see. I'm gonna zoom in a bit on this curve and just sort of uh, show from the decline of the winter surge 2020, uh, 2021 up until uh, this past week. And you can see the winter 2020, 2021 surge to the left as it was on its downward slope. You can see the Delta surge beginning in July, 2021 with a pronounced steep curve uh, rise in cases followed by a slower downward slope that did not achieve low levels um, before Thanksgiving. And uh, we saw an increase in cases as we approached Thanksgiving with a, um, a large increase in the last week. And that's what you can see at the very um, far end of the, the curve. We start to see a, a, a much higher uh, line come down. This is typical um, of past 
um, surge experiences for the holidays too, as I said, as we have reached about 10 to 12 days post most festivities. With our layered approach of prior, uh, prioritizing uh, vaccine administrations, local face covering requirements and encouraging community practice, the, the community practice distance and hand washing in settings, we are hoping, hoping that we'll dampen the rise in cases and keep um, from over overwhelming our hospital systems. So I do ask today that everyone do their part in making the upcoming holidays as healthy and safe as possible. If you are not already vaccinated, uh, then please make this a gift to yourself and to those who love you. And um, while we'll make it through, like while we make it through the holidays and uh, the potential for higher rates of cases, please remember our face covering requirement and wear a mask when in indoor public spaces. Also remember to keep your distance between you and others not in your household when shopping or visiting indoor spaces. And for lots of good reasons uh, this season, please remember to wash your hands. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about another reason why that might be important. These measures um, that I just mentioned are just as important as we learn more about the Omicron uh, variant, which has now been identified in several US states. And at the time, as I walked into this briefing, I am not aware of it being identified in North Carolina yet, but we can assume that it is circulating. These same measures of masking, uh, ventilation, distancing, and hand washing will also help protect you and others um, as we are being introduced to the Omicron variant. In terms of cases uh, by age, the proportion of case burden has not changed significantly. The majority of new cases are still in our 25 to 49 year olds. Um, I believe it's about 40%, followed by our less than 18 year olds, so that's our zero to 17 population, who remain stable um, at about 21%. While I did have a moment, I did want to talk um, a little bit about seasonal flu. Um, we are at the beginning uh, of what appears to be our seasonal flu uh, period. We are starting to see some flu activity in the state. It remains low at this point, uh, but we are seeing higher levels than what we saw last year. That dark blue line that you're seeing up there right now is COVID-19 and went on the same graph with the other respiratory illnesses clearly dwarf the others. Um, as it is continuing to be the most predominantly uh, circulating respiratory illness. But if we focus in on the other respiratory illnesses, that uh, little insert at the top, we can see that rhinoviruses are still um, making a show. So that's some common cold types of things. But of interest is the green line, which is, uh, was very low and is starting to tick up. That's the line for influenza. So like I said, influenza is beginning to trend upward in North Carolina. The North Carolina surveillance systems um, detected more influenza uh, viruses during the week of November 14th through the 20th than during any week since March 2020. So we're, we're just taking some note of that. Flu vaccine is available for individuals six months and older. You can visit us at the health department. You can visit your medical home or your, um, your own provider. Typically, we'll have them um, or many pharmacies in the area um, carry flu vaccine as well. And just remember that the same measures that we put in place to protect us and help reduce the spread of COVID-19 also help us reduce the spread of flu. So I'm gonna change gears a little bit and um, just talk about COVID vaccine operations and just give you an update about where we are with some of our um, vaccine administration outreaches So this slide has been updated. Um, our immediate focus has and continues to be providing access um, to vaccine for our pediatric population, um, but we do offer all vaccine types at all of our events as well. Our 40 Cox location continues to operate. It is right now Tuesday through Friday, nine to four, so that we can have um, those Saturday events as well. And you can see here um, in the last week, we provided over 655 doses in that place in that space and location alone. Our Saturdays at school events have continued to be successful, reaching hundreds of people. Um, we do have them listed up there. 
Thanks to our partners at MAHEC and FEMA for adding two additional schools to the schedule so that we can have coverage throughout the county. And just some highlights, our last um, four events, we've reached um, 393 at Asheville Middle, 149 at North Buncombe, 250 at Irwin, and 234 at Robertson. We have two events coming up um, this weekend at Owen and at AC Reynolds. So in addition to the pediatric outreach, um, Buncombe County HHS continues to provide vaccinations um, for long-term care facilities and homebound. Our um, Buncombe County and partners at CareMedics have provided over 100 uh, homebound doses and provided vaccine services to an additional 10 long-term care facilities since the last time we updated you all on that in October. So that's just since October, 100 um, additional homebound and 10 more long-term care facilities. And that um, for our grand total of what Buncombe County HHS has administered, we've given out a total of uh, 106,364 doses since December of 2020. When we look at uh, vaccine uptake by age, we continue to see a nice steady increase in pediatric doses administered. Since the last commissioner's update, we have seen a 10 percentage point increase in that age group, rising from 15% to 25%. Other age groups continue to see incremental um, increases, a percentage point here or there. And uh, just of note, Buncombe County HHS is administering about 300 boosters um, each week. And that's just a reminder for anyone who's 18 and up, if you finished um, your two series, you are um, eligible for a, and recommended to get a booster six months after your second dose. If you received a one dose series and 18 and up, you're recommended to get your booster two months after your series. And then um, for those still needing to start their vaccine series, we have about 300 $100 incentive cards left before supplies run out. Just to let you know, we have successfully um, distributed all transporter cards and there are no supplies left of that. And so, um, you know, like I said, not many left. I did want to note that we are approaching the one year anniversary of receiving our first shipment of COVID-19 vaccine in Buncombe County. And just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to the public health staff, our emergency management support, uh, and every vaccine provider in the community and the numerous volunteers who have dedicated um, and provided this service in order to better protect our neighbors. So as I close out with additional holidays approaching, please help us main, uh, minimize the impact of COVID-19 this holiday season. Check out bunkumready.org for some holiday tips and recommendations as you plan events. And please plan your events with safety and health in mind. Thank you so much, commissioners, for your time today. Happy to answer any questions. Chairman, I got, got a question. Mm -hmm. um, Stacey, on your, your last side, slide, you had, um, I think it said 70% of the eligible population with one dose. I know we, we've been talking about this off, offline, and it sounds like it's something you're working on, but I guess can you tell us a little bit about where that number comes from and I guess how and or wh why to your knowledge, it's different from sure. both the state's numbers and the CDC's numbers. Yeah, so the um, the eligible population now is five and up. So when you're on the state dashboard, you have to be very make sure that you click on the right one because they do have it divided as uh, total population five and up, twelve and up, eighteen and up, and sixty five and up. And so that um, that seventy percent is the percent of our eligible population five and up who have received at least one dose. So not fully vaccinated, just one dose. Okay. Um, and that may differ from the CDC because there are some differences the way they co they collect data. So the I will tell you that the North Carolina um, dashboard is likely more accurate around what we do um, in North Carolina because it's we have our own COVID vaccine management system that a vaccine provider in North Carolina is going to be entering into it. So for the CDC, um, they they have acknowledged that um, some of their count from their county data is one missing, but two sometimes is by county of admi administration, not county of residence. So that's sometimes because we have a large 
VA hospital, that may be skewing the numbers that you see on the CDC as well. It, they have us at 81.5% of our total population receiving one dose, which I found awesome and exciting, but, but you're saying that's, that's wrong, but the silver lining is that those people are still in our community, they just might be outside of our that's correct, and it, that is correct about the Veterans Administration. Yes, they are coming into our community for sure to, for services, so yes. So perhaps the CDC's numbers for neighboring counties perhaps might be low, is that? Uh, they do make state? a, dis they do in their notes section on the CDC vaccine data, they talk about how it can fluctuate, um, that some counties may see higher, some may see lower um, based on the way that they gather that data. They make every effort to get county of residence, but um, when it's missing or if they don't, it may default to administration or, or something else. Well, th well, thank you for clearing that up and let us, let us know what the best single source of truth is as we go forward with all this. And yes, right now, I, absolutely, the North Carolina um, dashboard is sort of my, my guiding light. Right, Stacy. Thank you so much for the update. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, Mr. Robert. Not really. Well, a question you can get back to us or okay. an answer uh, on the incentive cards. How are they being tracked? Because I've been hearing that we've had some people going and get multiple shots over a three-day period at each location, and and the thing is, this is all hearsay and some have been hospitals they uh, put in. Have you heard any of that? So thanks for the question. I can tell you just a general overview. So we have not, when we had the state incentive program, we had two systems running at the same time. We had the state um, quality assurance and quali uh, quality program to ensure that um, incentive cards were distributed correctly. And we actually in Buncombe County have our own um, internal process for that. So even in the absence of the state one, we still have a very robust um, tracking mechanism and monitoring of those in incentive cards. And they are routinely audited. And so um, for the incentive cards, one, you must meet the eligibility. And so that for, for right now, all we have left are the incentive cards that are, are the 100 ones. So that has to be that you're uh, 18 and over and getting your first dose. If folks don't meet that eligibility, then they're not, um, they can't receive one. And then um, when folks receive their, uh, when folks receive their first dose, they must complete their 15 minutes before they can receive the, that incentive card. So they have to get their, their vaccine, they have to wait their 15 minutes um, in observation, and then they can receive the card. Once the card is uh, distributed to them, it is logged and they initial. So we're logging even before the in incentive cards get to the clinic. They're being tracked and monitored and logged by our admin staff as well each day. Whatever cards the um, clinic doesn't use or the outreach doesn't uh, event doesn't use for that day are returned and put into a secure location with our admin staff. Now, as far as folks um, getting multiple doses, anecdotally, folks were, were concerned about that. So we can't ask for identification for the actual vaccine. You can provide it for us. You can provide us lots of information um, for the vaccine, but we are not required to take it. For the incentive cards, if we have a question about you potentially coming in multiple times, we can ask for that because the incentive card is completely separate from the actual vaccine itself. So we put in multiple layers um, of quality assurance to ensure that we don't have folks coming back. I am not aware of anyone being hospitalized because of multiple doses. Not hospitalizations, no. All right, Stacy, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next up is a public input software demo, and Lillian Grovis will help us out with this item. Hi. Um, so for this demonstration, we actually have a little exercise. So if you have your laptop or your phone handy, you can participate. If you don't want to participate, we'll show it on the screen and you'll get to see it regardless. But um, that's why the QR code is next to your place. We're not ordering food from a restaurant. That's part of the activity. 
So <coughs> recently, Buncombe County um, uh, started a contract with publicinput.com, which is a public engagement portal. You may have seen this portal used by the city of Asheville. Um, it was a tool that we used during the Vance Monument Task Force that was really beneficial. Um, and so for us, let's see. Max, that's not forwarding on the screen. It's what? We're having fun today. There we go. So now it's moving on its own. OK. <laughs> so what it is, it's a public engagement portal. Um, it allows us to get quantitative data for public engagement. And that's historically uh, one of the hardest things to do when we're looking at public engagement is get that quantitative data. We're really good at the qualitative data. We are able to take user-provided data and couple that with publicly available data, so the information that we got from the most recent census. We can layer those over each other and ensure that we are getting equitable and representative engagement. The other benefit to this tool is that it's actually available in more than 100 languages, and the user can pick that. Um, it also allows us to expand access to participation and viewing for boards and commissions that are not currently streamed. I know we have a lot of uh, boards and commissions, but we don't have online. And as we work through the rollout of this platform, we'll be able to get all of those online so that everyone can see and participate, watch, provide comments. Um, it is not a replacement for our grassroots engagement work. Um, our public engagement team is out in the community every day. We're at our community engagement markets. We're handing out information about comp plans to people who are waiting in line for vaccines. We are trying to go where people are to help uh, bring them into the fold in our governmental processes. Um, and so this is certainly not a replacement for that. It doesn't replace our code red texting. Um, and it also doesn't replace, it's not solely digital. We are able to take hard copy surveys and questionnaires and input them into this so that we have data from that as well. So we do not have a digital divide, even though this is a digital platform. Um, why are we doing this? We are really, really good. If you can see that second orange column that's, that says inform, this is the spectrum of community engagement to ownership. And we are great at fact sheets and open houses and presentations. We excel in that area. But, but we want to get down the line so that we are making sure that the leadership and expertise that resides in Buncombe County is at the table helping make uh, informed decisions for leaders, for boards, commissions, departments, and everyone in Buncombe County. So currently, we've got a soft launch happening. Um, tomorrow, for those of you who are interested in the ad hoc reappraisal committee, you don't have to attend the meeting. If you are unable to attend, we will actually be running that meeting through our engagement portal. People are able to participate in public comment virtually for that meeting. We are going to take one hour of public comment at the beginning of the meeting, and so we will be using this platform for that soft launch. You'll also see it used extensively in the comprehensive plan. In January, the folks who are sitting behind me are coming out of the gate with a lot of meetings. Um, so how do we make sure that the data that we're gathering there is informing our decisions all the way through the life of the comprehensive plan? Ferry Road, we also are using the public engagement portal for that and then the Anka Heritage Trail will be rolling out on that. We are going to have a tiered rollout plan. So over the next year and a half, um, by July 2023 is our goal, we will have all of our boards, commissions, and departments utilizing this platform um, for our public engagement initiatives. Um, look for those broad internal and ex external communications in January, especially so people feel comfortable when they hear about the comprehensive plan meetings and that it's going to be um, through our public engagement portal, they'll know this is a, a safe portal for us to engage with the county in. Um, we're also aligning with our strategy and innovation department. They facilitate a lot of projects, and so this platform will be a great tool for them um, so they can use as much or as little as they'd like as they're rolling out those projects. So here's our chance to try it. Um, if you have your phone, you can 
hit that QR code. If you don't, if you're not a QR code person, that's fine. You don't have to be. You can just type in engage.buncombecounty.org forward slash F3500. And that F3500, that's just an automatically generated number. We can customize that if we want to, but we are still kind of sailing the ship and learning all at the same time, so we didn't want to get too fancy for you today. <clears throat> so when you go to that site, is there something fancy I need to do, Max, or is it just slow? Okay, it's just taking a second. So when you get to that page, when you've hit that QR code or entered in that website, you don't need to enter www because it's already a secure site, so forget about the w's. Then you'll type in your email address, your phone number, and your name. You can attend virtually or in person, however you prefer. And you can also click that button to subscribe for updates on this board briefing. That's just a way so that following the briefing, if we want to send a message and let everyone know the outcomes of any deci particular decision that was made during this time, we've got it. I would love to do that. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my personal stuff. And off I go. I am signing in. So, um, so now we've signed into our, our December 7th meeting. You'll see this blue box at the bottom, and if you hover over it, it'll allow you to continue into that meeting page. But you'll see you can participate by phone, so you can actually call into this meeting and listen on the phone. So if you don't have the capabilities to watch on TV, you can just listen. Or you can email in your comments so that if you can't attend, you can still submit your information. And then we go to our meeting page, and you'll see that was a great day at the library there. Um, and we've got our information. You can type in a comment about this meeting. And that will be displayed. And then we've got, we've got some really important questions here. So you're going to be asked uh, this, question, this ranking question of what's your favorite sandwich? You have four options there. And you can rank those. We've got pimento cheese. Grilled cheese, PB&J, and egg salad. I might have been thinking about the masters when we were coming up with these sandwiches. So you can actually rank these. And the benefit to this is going to be that once you complete this uh, during the meeting or, or say it's, you know, perhaps a more relevant to topic, we can actually get this data in real time so that it's helping to shape the decision-making process. So I'm going to confirm those priorities peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So we can already see that we've got a lot of PB&J people here, but pimento cheese is, is really rocking the game. And then we've got consensus building, right? So we want to know how people are feeling about things. And so we went with a really polarizing topic of pineapple on pizza. If we're into pineapple on pizza, we can make that decision. So you just do thumbs up or the red button. I personally think that pineapple is great on pizza. Once you do that, you can hit continue, and then you'll ask, be asked another consensus question. It's time to let go of old pizza standards. I absolutely agree with that. And then finally, it's only acceptable if you add jalapenos. I'm, all, I'm very agreeable today. So I have completed that. And the final question is pretty important. It's what's your zip code? Um, so I'm a, I live in Black Mountain. I entered that in. And so for the user experience, I'm done. I have now participated in this board meeting. Um, but what we'll see on our background, on our back end, is actually the analytics here. So we're able to see. We've got 117 responses on this. We might have tried it out with, with our manager's advisory group earlier. <laughs> but anyone who's in this meeting right now or watching on TV is also able to participate. So we know that Pimento cheese, uh, Commissioner Beach Farrar has, has led the, the, the way on the pimento cheese, I can tell, and we've got, there are, many people are in support of the pimento cheese. We also have a good number of people who agree that pineapple should never be on pizza, but the folks in my camp who disagree, we've got about 40%, so we're seeing that. But then this is a really useful tool for us, and that's the map. And we can overlay important information like 
the current commissioner districts. Um, now these are as of today, not as of any date in the future, but we can see where our participants are. And so we know if we need to dedicate more of our public engagement time in these rural areas because they're not lighting up blue. We're not seeing them as participants in our public engagement strategy. We can also uh, identify it by incorporated areas, so your townships, your school districts, uh, and also your zip codes. Um, and so that one um, is a great tool for us. And so as we look at our zip codes, we know um, where we are and where we're not and where we need to be. Um, and so that's kind of some of the reasons why we're moving toward this, to help us find those places where we just haven't uh, reached the community and got a firm grasp of how they want to be represented in the projects that we're doing here, uh, that we're doing now, and that we're doing in the future. Any questions? Uh, that map you're showing with the, the, I guess, the point data and the geocoding, is that based on someone's area code or their physical location where they're taking the quiz or the, or, or what? So because I asked you for your zip code, we're able to identify it based on that. But say that we didn't want to ask you for anything at all, we would actually look at it based on your IP address. So we wouldn't know who you are specifically, but we would know the general area of where you are. If we wanted to go a step further, we could ask you for your home address. Um, but we don't always want to ask our community members that, and they don't always want to provide it. So this is a way for us to scale up or scale down um, how much information we're asking. And even if they want to keep it anonymous, we can still go off of IP addresses to help us get a sense of where people are. Thank you, Lillian. I'm really excited about this, and I, I love the fact that you're going to be able to have this kind of that data there. And I, I especially love the fact this uh, spectrum of community engagement and that awareness that we're in the inform and we want to move on to the, uh, the involve and the collaborate, which I think is great. So thank you so much for your work and your team's work on this. Absolutely. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize we've got, you know, Dan Hess, who sits in the back and doesn't, um, isn't a, a big talker during commissioner meetings, has been a real, um, real asset in this process. Not only is there a huge public engagement learning curve for us on this, but there's a real digital learning curve for us. And so our web team, Anthony Carone, Max Tainer, even our new staff member, Kirby, who you'll see back in the production room, um, we have hit the ground running on training so that come January when our comprehensive plan folks are telling us that we're ready to go, we're gonna be ready to go right along with them. All right, thank you so much for the updates on all this. It's great work, appreciate it. Next up is an update on the Comprehensive Plan Public Outreach Plan, and Jillian Phillips and Nate Pennington are gonna help us out with this item. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm happy to provide an update for you all today. Um, let's go ahead and cue up the presentation, please. Thank you. Okay, so we're coming to you today to kind of give you a point in time um, update of where we are, where we're going in the future. I know we're all a little fatigued by uh, virtual platforms and, um, you know, that really limits us, but I really want to kind of give you a timeline and a map forward and sort of really help explain we're kind of in a messy phase. We're getting ready to enter a phase where there's going to be a lot of decisions that need to be made. And that part is called the public input and the community engagement phase. So a lot of it's going to be up to us. It's super important, of course, because we're also in that data discovery and sort of also that discovery of where residents are in terms of the issues themselves. So that being said, what we'd like to do for you first is uh, show you just a really quick video that uh, was produced in house uh, by the talents of our um, uh, Shannon Capazelli in the planning department with the assistance of Angie Lee who did the voice 
in the planning department and then um, uh, the talents of Max Painter to do the professional production of this, of this video, uh, which we will pull up in just one moment. Is YouTube, so we're going to have this maybe a slight ad on Nest D. Here it comes. You booked a cozy Verbo mountain cabin with a kitchen where everyone can share. What is a comprehensive plan? It's the document that's created when the community comes together to make a plan for what it wants the future to be like. The plan looks 20 years into the future by asking residents what they love about their community now and the things that need to be changed in the future. But that's not all. The plan also looks back on the history of our region to learn from our past and to recognize where we have been and where we want to go. So what will the plan be about? We have some important ideas to get us started, but residents might come up with even more. In general, a comprehensive plan can focus on infrastructure, multi-generational needs, equity, land use, healthy communities, the environment, transportation, affordable housing, hazards and emergencies, economic development, and more. So how does it work? First, we ask residents to tell us about the issues, needs, wants, and ideas for their community. Next, the plan creates a vision for what we want the county to be. Then it lists goals and actions for how to reach that vision. The plan will be used by Buncombe County in all sorts of ways that impact how our community changes over time. These changes can impact how and where land is used, public health, community character, accessibility, equity, and much more. So how do we get from point A, talking about the plan, to point B, creating the plan? First, we commit to a goal of reaching every resident of the county to ask them for their ideas and make sure along the way that all communities are being included. Then we take everyone's ideas to create a first draft of the plan. We take it back to the community to see if we got it right. We do this until we reach consensus on the community's vision. Finally, we adopt the plan. So what's next? We take our plan and we start creating ways to make it happen through the everyday decisions, services, and resources provided by your local government. So start thinking about it. What do you want your community to look like in five years, 10 years, and 20 years from now, what do you love and what can be improved? Now is our chance to create that vision together for ourselves, for our children, and for the future. Let's work together to create one Buncombe. for an in-house production. So anyway, uh, I'd like to um, uh, introduce um, the project team of the Long Range Division of the Planning Department, uh, Jillian Phillips, Shannon Capazelli, and Haley Mattress. They will take you through the rest of the slides here. And you can see, again, we also have our consulting team. Uh, they're gonna be available uh, via Zoom. This is um, just a quick introduction, and we plan to reserve the rest of the time for specifically answering questions of the commissioners. And we'd like to show you how the steering committee uh, fits in with the planning board and some of the other inputs as we move along the process. Jillian, Shannon. Hello. 
so this shows a little bit about the phasing that we have. You'll probably be familiar with this from past presentations. Um, we are just leaving phase one of the project, which is the launch. Um, we are moving into phase two mid-December, which is establishing the vis vision and goals of the project. And that's gonna be when we start our first big public engagement, uh, community engagement phase. So you'll start seeing advertisements for lots of meetings coming up. Then phase three is developing the policies and the strategies, and phase four will be adoption of the plan. So during phase one, uh, we went to uh, all of the departments in the county, we met with a lot of staff, and we asked them what they needed as a department over the next 20 years to better serve the public. We got a lot of great feedback from that. We've been doing um, interviews with you all. We've also had uh, stakeholder interviews. We've been gathering uh, data and information about the community. And um, we've held a kickoff meeting in October where we had uh, county uh, leadership, we had municipalities present, and we also had some utility providers and other individuals in that room uh, with our consultant team. And we rolled out the branding and the logo. We've also got uh, kind of the, the basic uh, website up and ready so that people can start seeing what's coming up and getting um, involved with those types of activities. So during phase one, some of the specific things that we did was the video you just saw. Uh, we rolled that out in both an English and a Spanish language version. We've been doing visioning activities with children uh, at different events in the community to get their uh, ideas of what they want the future to look like. We also have a weekly newsletter that goes out um, telling people what events are coming up and letting them know what we've been working on. Um, we were in the holiday parade recently. You might have seen us on TV, and we were able to pass out about 500 postcards that had our uh, engagement website on there to get people into some of the surveys that are actually live already. Uh, we have a kids' postcard project where children uh, and classrooms can draw a picture of what they want their community to look like and provide a narrative. And um, we've got a great gallery where you can see those, but we're also taking their narrative and we're plugging um, that information into some of our survey software so that it can be included right with um, the adults' information as well. And if you are in need of handouts, postcards, or flyers, uh, we've been giving out a lot of those so far and we can provide those um, to any groups that would wanna share them in the community. Thank you. One of the exercises we um, started the steering committee on before we go into this first public engagement phase is setting public engagement, education, and, um, and outreach objectives. So this, with the consultant's help, is what our steering committee has come up with. So number one, education throughout the process will advance the community's understanding of critical planning issues. Number two, Community members, including youth, people of color, and landowners that live outside the county will be given the choice and access to engage in the planning process through multiple activities. Number three, public engagement efforts will seek to engage a demographic diversity of residents that is representative of the community. If hard to reach communities are not engaged, New approaches for targeted outreach and engagement efforts will be leveraged to ensure equitable engagement across the county. Number four, participants' opinions will be respected, well-documented, and will inform policy direction in the plan. Number five, transparent public engagement efforts will seek to inspire trust and continued interest and involvement in the process. Number six, clear documentation, Project publicity and engagement activities will articulate how public input have been used to help inform policy direction throughout the process. And last one, I know there are a lot of them, they're all important. Number seven, community engagement will surpass past planning efforts. So that being said, again, we're moving into phase two in that first community engagement window. So this is the first opportunity for the public to have a lot of engagement opportunity for them to tell us what we want. And sort of the goal of this engagement window is for setting those visions and goals. What does the community want Buncombe County to look like in 20 years? So this will run from, from mid-December to mid-February. 
Um, we're going to finish up some stakeholder interviews, and we have a stakeholder survey. We're going to have county staff facilit facilitated engagement and outreach by community ambassadors. And we currently have up on our public engagement website for the comp plan, um, and we will continue that through the first through the second phase, a community vision word cloud. And this is a really simple sort of first way to get input, and it simply asks the community what for four words or phrases to describe what they want the county to look like in 20 years. So our big week of events is the week of January 10th, and we're gonna, ha we're gonna have three larger hybrid workshops, and that's hybrid using the public input software and three targeted meetings. And some of the things that will be included in that week of meetings is a community poll, small group discussions, and a mapping exercise. And we're gonna provide Spanish translation of materials and interpretation services at those events. So where are we gonna have these meetings? So the three hybrid public workshops we have decided to have one in North Buncombe, West Buncombe, and East Buncombe. And between when this slide was made and now, we've nailed down all the locations. So North Buncombe is gonna be Weaverville Community Center. West Buncombe is gonna be in Inca Middle School. And East Buncombe is gonna be at the East Asheville Library. Then we're gonna have the tar targeted community meetings. We're actually gonna have four of them. And we're trying to reach the populations that are harder to reach and haven't been reached in the past. So we've split those up into three groups, rural areas, historically disenfranchised communities, and youth. So for our rural meeting, we're gonna have that at Fairview Community Center. For our historically disenfranchised community, we're, we've targeted Emma, which is one of our legacy neighborhoods. And we're actually gonna have two meetings, one at Podair Emma, and one at Emma United Methodist Church. And then for our youth, we're gonna hold that at Skyland Library. So then just a note to the commissioners, community engagement windows may be extended or number of meetings may be increased based on the evaluation of the input received. Like, like Lillian was saying, that public input software gives us the ability to look at the engagement in real time and see where, see where the gaps are. So, an important part of that phase two is the stakeholder organization survey. We did do some stakeholder interviews, but now we're gonna send out a survey, again, using public input, and we're gonna target organizations with an interest in the county's future. So that's neighborhood associations, business organizations, equity and inclusion groups, our own boards and commissions, and then other groups, and other groups can be added that have that stake. And the purpose of this is to provide input for the foundation of policy direction, and it will be ongoing through that phase. And again, this slide, between when this slide was made and now, I think we have about 186 organizations targeted in the list to send this survey to. So after we move through phase two, just to give you an idea of what's up, we have phase three, and there will be two engagement windows in phase three. There will be a policy directions and priorities window, which is, which will include a policy, policy choice assembly, mini assemblies, and online activities. And then an engagement window three will be at a, about affirming the plan. So that's taking the draft plan out to the public and making sure we got it right. So I'm gonna hand this over to Haley and she's gonna talk about everybody's roles in the process. Um, okay, so I'll go over the planning process roles. Uh, so first are our residents and property owners, and this is where we really form the foundation for policy direction through their provided input. Stakeholder organizations, as Jillian said, we have a lot of those, will also be the other part of the foundation for policy direction through their inputs as well. Our steering committee are the reviewers and guiders of the plan development. There's 
planning board are the reviewers and endorsers of the plan development. Uh, board of Commissioners are the adopters and implementers of the final plan. Staff and consultants are technical assistants and the facilitators of the planning process. And there you have that. Um, and thank you for your time today. And we'll open up to questions from the commissioners on um, the public input process. And just to note for the commissioners, we do have Leanne King with Clarion on, on the line, I guess, through Zoom, if you have any questions for her. All right, commissioners, any questions or feedback? Yes, I have to thank you. I have some questions and feedback. And first of all, I do want to thank Jillian. I know I was at the Buncombe County Farm Bureau recently, and I was very pleased when Jillian actually had shown up and was there presenting, so I appreciate that. And I know you all have been putting forth a great effort to get out into the community, and I uh, encourage everyone to sign up for that weekly newsletter. It is excellent, so thank you all for all that great work. The, um, have, I watched the three virtual the meetings, and I, I do have a concern about doing all those virtually. I really feel like something is being lost when we do that. Um, so for the steering committee? For the steering committee, we yes. We have polled the steering committee, and they feel comfortable having an in-person meeting. If, if de Dependent on COVID numbers, we're going to check back in with them. So our February meeting with the steering committee, when we start feeding them sort of what we have gotten out of the community engagement window, that is going to be in person. Okay, well, great. I think that will be really positive because I do feel, just from watching those meetings, there's definitely something being lost. I don't feel like it's equal participation among the members because some, some folks just have more professional experience with utilizing Zoom than others. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're going to be able to meet in person so that they all, all their voices will be heard and they'll be able to participate. The, um, the other thing that I'm, I am concerned about when I look at the areas that you are getting ready to do outreach, this has happened in the past with the county, and so I'm going to bring it up again. This happened when strategic planning was happening before. There's a very significant part of the county there, that whole Irwin Lester area, which is very distinct from when you go to Inca High School or you're going to the Weaverville community that you're leaving out with this. And I think it's really important that you don't do that. So I think you should look at making sure that we have some kind of public engagement in that area. So I've actually had a discussion with um, someone at Lester Community Center uh, about scheduling sort of smaller meetings at Lester, both Lester Community Center and Sandy Mush that um, staff would lead in after that week of January 10th and then rolling into February trying to schedule meetings at those two community centers. We're really trying with the staff-led engagement to go out where they are, where they want us to come. So um, I did have that discussion with her and that's we're aware of that and I can let you know if we do end up scheduling those. If the commissioners wanted, we could have a meeting out in Sandy Mush to Leicester. Um, we do have extra money in that budget for additional public meetings. And, and I would say, I mean, if you're talking about doing staff-led, I mean, for Sandy Mush, that's fine because that's pretty remote, as we all know. But, um, and, and having one at the Leicester Community Center could be good, as you're saying. But there's still a, you know, there's a significant part of the population around that Irwin High School area. So you may just look, if you're wanting to do staff-led in that way, you may want to look at some additional ones, too, if you're, because there's, yeah, there's a lot of folks in that whole Irwin area, and there's several, you know, there's diverse languages spoken as well, which I'm, I'm glad to see that you have translators that are going to be working with you. Sure, and, and part of it, too, it's been uh, a little tricky, and that's why we're here today, to get this feedback. Um, it's been a little tricky with the schools. Uh, it's kind of a decision that's made school by school, principal by principal. Um, but I think what I'm hearing uh, today is maybe some direction to go ahead and look at having maybe a little bit of a larger meeting in that particular area, uh, specifically Lester. 
I, th I think it's worth looking at, and especially if if Irwin High School was willing to do that because you, you pull in that entire area. So that would certainly be something to look at. And as you mentioned, Commissioner, as we get the data from the analytics that we're putting in place, we can see what's missing and then we can have staff led. What we were talking about before was the consultant led in some of the bigger groups, but as we get data, we can have more staff led meetings. So our goal would be to see what data and what places we're missing and where we're not hearing from people. Our we want to travel to make sure we hit the entire county, but we started with this first and see what's missing. And if we can get people from Sandy, Marsha, Lester that comes to Anchor or to Irwin, we want to make sure we can track that. Mm -hmm. So the goal would not to stop this. This is our start. And once we get data, then we can go from there. Okay, so I understand. I do, I still think it would be worth reaching out to the Irwin area and looking at that because that actually encompasses Emma as well. Mm -hmm. So you, you may want to consider that. Thank you. All right, any other questions or thoughts to share at this time? A couple of things. Like, just first of all, it was awesome to see at the Christmas parade, our comprehensive plan had its own float. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> that was really cool. That's a, a great way to get it in front of people that weren't expecting to hear that phrase that, that day. Um, regarding the differences between engagement window number two and engagement window number three, I guess the, the latter is when you're unveiling something to the public to kind of cross-reference what the status of the plan with the public to see if we're on the right track. I guess, just briefly tell me more about what what it is you'd be showing. So what, what level of detail are we showing the, the public? On, in engagement num window three? Yeah, yeah. Um, so sort of the meat and bones of the plan, the policies and actions, that's what we would be showing. So engagement window number two, we'd be asking for their direction regarding policies. And then engagement window number three, we would say, this, these are the policies and actions you as a community have indicated you want us to follow. Um, confirm that that's what you want. And I think also what we probably need to do, and, th and I, like I mentioned, this is the, the point in time where Everyone wants to be there, um, but what we probably need to do um, is the planning board has also requested sort of a meeting to understand how they uh, fit in with uh, goals, objectives, and policy. Um, things that will happen in the future are going to be um, joint meetings between boards and commissions. We're going to need to work out some schedules as well as flow charts. I think flow charts would be exceptionally helpful to then take us from gathering in the discovery phase to how does it all start fitting in in terms of how do we then develop the plan itself. And maybe Leanne, can we hear you? She, yeah, can you, uh, okay, testing, testing, is this working okay? Can you hear me yes. okay? Could you maybe <laughs> um, for Parker um, talk about engagement window number three and engagement window number two a little more? Sure, yeah, glad to jump in. Thank you all for letting me um, participate virtually. I appreciate it. Um, very good question. I, I would say that um, we build public engagement processes to be cumulative. So this first round, again, we're really focused on creating um, an understanding of the community's aspirations for the vision and goals for the community. When we come back in the second round of engagement, community engagement window number two, what we'll be doing is confirming that what we heard in the first round is accurate. So we'll have some testing to make sure that the vision and goals that we've drafted are resonating with people. And then we'll also um, be testing some policy direction ideas. So we, we, you know, we, we know what, what the community wants in terms of vision and goals, but there are choices about the specific policy directions that you might take to achieve those um, goals. And so we wanna test out those options in the second window. And then we will take that learning from the community, those inputs, and develop uh, a draft, what we call the public review draft of the comprehensive plan. And that's what we would be sharing in the third engagement window. And so that would be an opportunity to again say, hey, we heard you in rounds one and two. This is what we interpreted was the direction that you wanted the plan to take. Tell us if we got it right. Um, and there's, there's also an opportunity for people to um, 
articulate the specific priorities that they might want the county to be focusing on as part of implementation of the plan. That's another aspect of that round of engagement. So once we get through round three and get those inputs from the community on the public review draft, then we can create what we call the public hearing draft. So we would revise the plan, work with the steering committee to fine tune it before it goes through the formal um, adoption process. And I believe we've got some meetings even built in before the adoption hearings start to be bringing this to the planning board and to um, board of county commissioners to um, share with you what the process and answer any questions before we go into that adoption um, hearing phase of things. So glad to answer any other questions that you might have. Thank you. Just any other questions from commissioners? Uh, just one final question. Did I understand you correctly that if there are groups that would like to have staff meet with them that you are planning those type of special focus. Okay, thank you. We're booked out for the foreseeable future. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this is maybe just more of a philosophical question, but you know, I mean, a lot of this talks about public input and kind of finding consensus and stuff, but of course there's lots of issues that there's not consensus on. Right. In fact, many of them are very controversial when it comes to growth and development and all these different issues. So I guess I'm just not raising any particular issue, but on issues where there's, you know, there's a lot of different diverging viewpoints out there. I'm assuming that this doesn't mean that those will be issues that the comprehensive plan doesn't take on, right? Like um, that there will be issues where there's a lot of strongly held views on different sides. So consensus isn't necessarily realistically an outcome, but you're looking for, you know, you're still looking for community input. There might be a preponderance of ideas or, I don't know, just how do you, I guess I'm, it's just an open-ended question of how you're gonna take on issues where there's strongly held views, divergent views on some of the key growth issues facing the community. Yeah, sure. And so you know you're successful, one of the key measures of the conference plan, if you've had those passionate conversations. And by passion, I mean two opposing sides. So for instance, let's use not the most controversial example, but let's say sidewalks. We know that there's areas of the county that they're more urban levels of service, but we actually need to translate where sidewalks are needed and hear from the community about where sidewalks are needed so that we can prioritize those areas as a technical committee and staff, hear from the different groups that we're working with, with the steering committee, with the planning board. We need to sit with the planning board for a while and develop those goals, objectives, and policies. And you're right, we're not always gonna find consensus, but at the end of the day, when we're passing a law in the General Assembly, the House has to come together with the Senate and reconcile. So I guess the goal is that while not everybody might be happy, everybody might get something. There's gonna be some level of consensus, although there's not gonna be a complete utopia. But the idea is to spur those conversations, especially when they come to things like affordable housing and density and critical facilities and infrastructure so that we can hear from everybody and that everybody doesn't feel polarized and that they're not being heard. And then we can start the sausage grinding of coming together with the commissioners in tandem with the planning board and the steering committee and staff and see a direction forward for the county. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you for the update, appreciate it. And next up is comp uh, an update on the compensation plan and Sharon Burke will help us out with this. I also have Rusty Mao with me, and Rusty will be assisting me through this presentation. So today I just wanted to provide a update on the work that we have done um, over the last few years on the compensation study. Um, normally I would use the acronym of COMP study, but since I just came on the heels of the COMP study, 
we want to make sure that in case I just say comp study, that's what I'm talking about, compensation. So this has actually been a multi-year process that we have, that's the wrong page, I'm sure. There we go. This has been a multi-year project that started back in 2018 when Evergreen came in and did the initial study. And the work that Evergreen did really identified some of the gaps that we have here at the county. And they focused on the fact that we really didn't have a compensation po uh, policy, that we had not studied our internal equity, and that we really needed to pay attention to um, functions of the job and really look at what, um, what we're actually looking at in regards to how we compensate our employees. And I think what's really important um, is to acknowledge that, you know, as we start looking at the compensation study, it's the foundation, um, the foundation of retention, how we, we, we look at getting folks to want to work for Buncombe County. And so with that said, um, a different view of this project timeline um, starts back in March of 19, and that's when um, the report came to the county manager. And from that, um, what was identified was, again, we, we needed to have a compensation philosophy. And so at that point, we brought together a group of employees throughout the county. Every department was recognized and was included in this compensation study, so every department had input. And so this slide shows historical work that, again, started in 19, um, and it will culminate with a report that will go to the county manager around December 31st of this year. And despite, you know, if you look at the various um, milestones, you know, um, in December, we, we provided the compensation policies or they were created. If you know, we haven't actually implemented those policies and the reason for it is those policies actually contradicted the, the existing ordinance and so we had to wait until we actually were able to you know, work on the ordinance and, and, and do the work that we're doing at the same time and then the policies will be brought out before you. And like I mentioned earlier, we are in the final stages of this phase four. So again, this is another view on, on the, the foundation and really starting with the, you know, looking at our philosophy, um, looking at what we need to do to preside, pr provide consistent uh, pay po processes and policies um, and how to handle each employee's pay. Then we looked at job descriptions and it was making sure that we have clear and consistent duties and expectations for all our employees to work from. Then we looked at the employee data and job history, experience and education. And it's culminating with the established compensation philosophy and having that in place so we can analyze our current state of classifications with our compensation. So as I mentioned earlier, we did put together a work group um, and that was in around June or so of 2019 and a lot of their work finished at the end of 2019. Um, the focus of that group has always been to ensure that there was equity in the pay, and so that's where some of the, the policies that you'll see shortly. Um, and I think it's important to, to look at some of the accomplishments the group had created. You know, it's, it's documenting current state of internal pay practices, um, again, developing the compensation philosophy, defining the guidelines um, on how to pay people effectively, and identifying the necessary changes that are needed um, within our personnel ordinance. And so moving into the study, the focus has really been on analyzing and grading positions based on general duties of the job and their complexity and the skills required to complete the work. It's important to know that the study is um, not a study to adjust compensation based on merit. It really is looking at the actual duties needed to complete the job. So I'm actually gonna scroll through this part. Get to my left here. There we go. Um, what is um, before you right now, this is actually the compensation philosophy that was brought forward to the commission back in 2019. Um, and our focus on this is really to have, a, uh, have externally competitive and internally equitable total compensation packages to create a merit system to reward employees for the normal, for above normal performance. Acknowledge and protect the work-life balance in order to retain our employees. Create a career progression and a succession plan. 
and have internal culture that is based on respect and accountability. And so when I came um, to the county, we put through the, the compensation project plan and phase one um, that was um, implemented back in um, January, I'm sorry, November of last year. And really our charge has been to analyze our position duties, ensure proper grading and classification for each position and compare our data against the market. Um, we then reviewed um, our, in, in our evaluation and market study was, was looking at equity as well. Um, <clears throat> and then we were gonna be making a recommendation and that's part of our final study and that is uh, the report and the findings are due to the county manager on December 31st of this year. Um, once that report is delivered, um, our expectation is that a report with recommendations will be provided to the commission in the spring of 2022. I'm gonna have Rusty talk about this slide. So as, as Sharon's laid out with the uh, compensation philosophy, wanting to be a leader in the market, we start to get to this question of comparison. So any time we talk about price data or economic data, we have to start to normalize. Um, there's really two important considerations in order to be able to compare. Number one is who do we wanna compare to? And number two is how do we compare? Um, so the first, uh, the title here is really referencing identifying our market peers. Um, so what we started to do, we typically look at the largest 10 counties in North Carolina, Buncombe being one of those, as, as really a reference point across the state. Um, but then you see here within North Carolina, we also wanted our close proximity peers, the city of Asheville, Madison County, Henderson County. Um, from there, we, we talked to Nate's team, we talked to the chamber, Tim Love, um, really thinking about who are some of our um, peers outside of North Carolina. So similar um, type of challenges, type of workforce, so some of those gateway communities. And you see those listed here, Nashville, Bend, Oregon, Charleston, um, and then we wanted to make sure that we're mindful of while about an hour away, still a potential competitive market being Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so that's how we identified the peer list. So then we move into normalization. There's really two steps to that. Um, and it's really a question of normalization based on the cost of living, the area trends, and then a normalization based on the job. And Sharon will talk a little bit more about that, but it's really the question, is a budget analyst here the same as a budget analyst in a different organization? Um, so when we think about how we would normalize, we use the uh, Bureau, Bureau of Economic Analysis Regional Price Parities. Um, so Bureau of Economic Analysis being a federal government agency that's a data set that they, they produce that very similar to uh, a consumer price index, it, it gives a, a regional price index for different metropolitan areas throughout the United States. Um, it's an unbiased source, it's, it's uh, produced by the federal government. It's accessible, it's free, it's available that anybody could see what the different inputs are, are in there to understand that methodology. Um, so as we, as we look at that, we look through these different, uh, different markets, we, we take that uh, index and we're able to compare, um, say 40,000 or 50,000 here versus somewhere else, how far will that take you on average as, as the average person in that market? Um, so as we, as we do that to be able to understand the, the regional prices, regional considerations, then it gets into the question of the actual job. And I'll, I'll turn it back to Sharon um, to talk more about that. But it's important to know that we don't have data on every position. Um, this federal s data source for the index is that we can get it for every metropolitan area. That's very helpful. But as it relates to that survey of the job data, it's, you know, do we have, uh, really benchmark jobs, so thinking about those jobs that most organizations would have, and then were we able to collect that information, did people respond to our survey um, and, and considerations like that. So this is just kind of a, a sneak, uh, just a little bit of a in-depth look at, at what that methodology for normalization looks like. Not sure there's no more. Sorry about that. So when we started looking at positions, um, and what we did was we pulled, a, pulled, again, the benchmark positions that we could get data for. And so when you look at this position, um, I, I chose a position that we don't have an employee in right now. 
And what this is saying is that we had 12 responses to the data inquiry. Of those 12 responses, Buncombe County um, is paying above market. And so I, I'm looking at, if you look from left to right, New Hanover is, has the, the highest compensation offered um, based on the, the um, BA uh, RPP. Um, and then Durham has the least. And so what that says to us is that right now we are paying that position above market. The other area that's really important that I show you is, and I think this is, yeah, this is beautiful. She set it up for me this morning. Um, the match level where it says the exact, fair, and good, exact. When we went out to provide the information to the, the survey respondents, what we asked them to do is look at the job descriptions. We actually gave them the information about each one of our jobs that we asked for information on. And we said, look at our job descriptions, the education, the experience, and the duties. Does that match exactly? fair, good, or doesn't it match at all? And if it matches exact, let us know it matches exact so that way we know we really are truly looking at positions that are similar versus if you have, like just use me, you might have an HR director in one organization that has a vice president of human resources. Well, then we're not looking at the exact same apples to apples. So we wanted to make sure that worked there. On the opposite side, here is, we have, many of our, we have many employees in the administrative support associate level. What we found in our administrative support classification is that we are not meeting market. And so of the 13 responses, five pay less than Buncombe, eight pay more than Buncombe. Um, and you'll see when you hit your match level, our normalization and then our match level, um, we had some that were exact, some that are good. What we found in this category is that where the data that we're getting back is our job descriptions were classified more like a clerk. And so that's why we were being paid a little bit longer or a little bit lower. And so what that says to um, my analysts is that this probably isn't the right grade for this position. So where are we right now? So we're currently working on creating job families and compatible factors for the organization. Um, and what that is, let me see if I'm going to switch over here. Um, so by putting the, the families, um, putting positions in families, it, it provides an avenue for us to begin succession planning. Um, and career progression, which is, is what employees are really looking for right now. They want to stay with our organization, but they need to see that there's a place for them to grow. And right now, we don't provide them with a very clear path for them to do that. Um, we're also looking at a new projection for how we base our pay. And then looking at, right now, if you are an exempt and you're a non-exempt employee, hour versus salary, you could both be a 56S and 56H. It's really confusing to employees. They don't necessarily know what the difference is, so we're separating that. Um, we're creating new grades. And so um, you'll see something that is much more comprehensive um, when we provide the report to you shortly. Um, and once again, the, the work that we're doing, it's market driven. We really are looking at the market. How are we preparing for our peers um, at a point in time? And then that's what our report will be for. Results, I should, be, should say, our results will be. How about questions? Is there anything I can answer for you in regards to what I've provided? A lot of information. A question I have. Uh, when we look at these markets and we're comparing salaries, are we also looking at these markets and comparing cost of living? Yes. In fact, actually, that's what the work that Rusty was talking about, was looking at, you know, what's their cost of living? What are all the, the housing and, and the medical costs? Adding that right. in. And so when you look at your parity, that's why the normalization is so important. Because Asheville is a, high, is a higher cost area to live in. Okay. What isn't included in that data is, is the benefits factor. And, and we are going to be looking at that, but on a totally different survey. Why, why, is, why is that not included in this process? Because it really seems like such a fundamental part of like, you know, your job is like, mm -hmm. well, what's, the set, what's the paycheck and then what's the benefits? And people look at that together and of course do the comparisons we've done before. We know that Buncombe County has one of the most generous benefits package, you know, anywhere in the state. So it seems like that should be uh, looked at together. So 
Well, it, it seems like it should. It's, it, it really isn't. Total compensation isn't something when you're looking at actual position, what's the position worth? And then how we keep employees, that's where your total compensation, that's where your, your compensation and your benefit package equals. And that's what attracts. But you usually don't do them at the same time. But, 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 this is, but the purpose of this study is to decide basically how much to pay people in their salaries. How much the position is worth to the county, correct? Not the people, how much the position is worth. For the purposes of thinking about what's the correct salary to keep and retain someone, correct? Mm -hmm. You know, or, you know, not individuals, but people, good employees within those positions. Um, but if you're, but if, if the, if Buncombe County's benefits policy is, you know, significantly um, superior to most of our peers, but then that's not considered in setting the salary benefits, then might we be like setting that number higher and if we're, if we're kind of ignoring the part where we're perhaps, you know, strongest in terms of our compensation, compensation package. Normally when, you, when you're doing a salary study, a salary study is, is truly simply looking at the job. Um, and I think, you know, when we get to the place where we're looking at the total compensation and looking at our benefit package and really comparing our benefit package to our peers so that we, we can provide you a total compensation number, um, it really is a separate, totally separate type of, 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 of work being performed. Other questions? <clears throat> Thank you. So will, will that total compensation then be part of the report that you're providing to the county manager that will come back to us? The next, the next survey that we're going to be doing is, is more on the benefit survey, so we haven't begun that one yet. Okay. What's coming in December is just the salary side, to Brownie's point. Benefits are not part of this conversation. And I guess to answer your question about why they're separate, right now, I would say that our compensation package, our salary, or just our base salary, that's what's important right now because we are losing people because they can leave on salary basis. Most of our employees are looking at what are their take home pay and what has that impact in their daily lives. They're not really looking at the benefit side. Really? The benefits. You think, it, you think most people, if they were going to leave a job, mm -hmm. go take a different job, wouldn't look at the salary and benefits of that other opportunity and compare it to their current opportunity? It seems it like most people would definitely look at both of that. It depends on where they are in their career. If they're closer to the retirement, that's something that they might look at. But most local governments in North Carolina, they all have the same retirement system. What we have different from most is our 401k. It is a little bit higher than most, but the rest of our benefits pretty much fall in line, and our health benefit tends to be pay a little bit less on our health insurance. But beyond that, our benefits across our state are pretty much the same, except for 401k and your health benefit. But most people depends on their status. If you're single and pretty healthy, they look at what their take home pay is and mobility. They don't really look at that benefit side. The health benefit. To me, it seems like that's, that's a significant benefit. And we've got a really good one, right? So. And most of the local governments do have a good health benefit. So we would look at benefits again, but that's not part of this study. When, we, when I came in 19, we had just finished Evergreen study. And that's what most people were concerned about. And still to this day, if you ask the employees, they're still very concerned on salaries. And that's where we're losing people is on salaries. I feel like when we did do that benchmarking on the health benefits, we were, we were way above the vast majority, even in the, even in the public space, which tends to be a, a generous sector. And of course, we don't only lose or gain employees to other governments. Some people go in the private sector and things like that. So, so yes, as I mentioned, healthcare and 401k are the only two differentiating factors that we have currently on our benefit side. I understand part of this. I mean, our benefits are not entirely uniform, but they're more or less uniform for employees regardless of how long they've been here or a veteran or their seniority or anything like that. Whereas I think the salary piece is where we haven't had the kind of clear guardrails and guide stars of like, Here's the philosophy through which we determine salaries at different bands and departments. So to me, that's what kind of the study is drilling down on. It, one of the functional outcomes of that is that we understand where we fit in the market in terms of overall ability to recruit and retain. But this is also, I think, just about us kind of finally getting our bearings and saying, 
there will be a logical, consistent way that Buncombe County assigns salaries to different every position within the organization. It's totally independent of benefits, so they're assigned pretty much everyone gets the same benefits regardless. I think it's important, you know, when, when you look at the way the ordinance is written in longevity, you know, our employees will get the COLA, but they don't get the bump within their position. They get it in a longevity bonus where not all employers do that. And so, you know, they're looking, if they can jump to another employer for 50 cents a dollar more an hour, um, they forget the longevity because they don't see that longevity as actually a bump within their salary grade. They just see that as something that they get as a bonus at the end of the day. I mean, I'd, I'd support changing it for that reason. I don't know if we can, but, um, you know, I think the hard part about this, because I mean, I think, and I think Desmond, what you just said, that makes sense. I mean, coming up with an internally coherent plan and a pathway forward, I mean, I think that, that all makes lots of sense. And we want to, of course, you know, uh, all the goals here that were described there, I mean, they're all very laudable, right? It's a great, sounds like a great culture that you would want to create, right, through all that. Of course, the, the challenge of all this that has to be, you know, one of the factors that goes into this too, though, is that we do live in a community where, like in so many different sectors, like the people who live here don't, you know, don't, um, you know, it's a, it's a community where we make less than the state average in most of our sectors in this community, uh, even though the cost of living is higher. So part of the challenge that we have to wrestle with on this is that at the end of the day, the folks who will be asked to basically finance all of this, you know, the taxpayers are not coming from the same standpoint, right? They're making less than their peers doing the same work around the state, and in some cases have higher cost of living. And, you know, we're a people organization, right? So like most of our costs are in terms of like paying the people to, to do the work. I think that's just, anyway, that's part of the challenge. It's like, you, we want to be, like, we want to live into all the ideals you've described, and I like it, but it's, um, at the end of the day, if it means, you know, this is going to mean a significant uh, impact in terms of what it means from a taxpayer standpoint, we have to think about that, too, because those are the constituents of, of the organization and the ones who will, who will under, you know, who will, who will finance all this, too. So that's, I don't know, it's just part of what, I'll just share it's just an observation of part of what I struggle with as a policymaker who would love to embrace all this, but also know how we pay for it is from people who will not share these same realities as, as people who work in our in our community. And there's trade there's just trade offs there. I mean, there's probably no way around it, but but I just I would share that. I think that. it's an interesting time though, as we continue to hear about, you know, the great resignation of people leaving the workforce in droves and now seeing how that's really impacting particularly our Gen Z and millennials, that from what I'm, I'm reading and following, that the benefits to those particular folks, it's all about the salary because, you know, they, they are younger, they're healthier, they're not thinking long term in that way. And what is impacting them is what they see at that paycheck. So they can afford a place to live, they can afford, you know, to travel, whatever it is that's important to them. And I'm really curious though, and this may not be quite the right forum, but it does sound like some of our surrounding counties, um, particularly in particular departments, are starting to find a way to pay more and that we're losing folks to them. So I'm curious as we look at that compensation, how does that factor in when um, smaller counties are able to pay um, higher wages? Um, you know, particularly I'm thinking like our paramedics in particular. Um, how are they achieving that? How do we retain? Um, anyway, I just say all that to say that I, I hear what you're saying about the benefits, but I really appreciate from what I'm digging into on this that we are looking at the salaries and particularly that trajectory of how you grow. I think that is a missing component that a lot of employers overlook so that when you do come in, you can see, well, I could stay with Buncombe County government for 20 years and start here and end up here. So I really do appreciate that y'all have dug in and really looked at how to retain folks. In that and if I would add that most of the counties are using ARPA funds. Gotcha. Thank you. Sorry, just reading, maybe over reading things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, 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 you know, if there's so much like um, interested in growing the salaries, which totally makes sense. I mean, I, I think that is the main driver, no question about it for people's just career, you know, um, you know, thinking in terms of all other things being equal. But, um, 
I mean, I think we do know from an organizational standpoint, the benefits are a big part of the compensation just in terms of what it costs us to, to do it. Um, and I know we've been looking at those and we've been bringing some good reforms to some of the compensation, I mean, to some of the benefits packages and I support that and just, I mean, if we are looking to grow the wage opportunities for folks though, and this is kind of a strategic conversation, right? Like we're trying to really map out the future. I mean, are there opportunities to, to kind of further say, you know, to the extent that we can have a long-term plan to manage our costs on the benefits side, you know, it creates more opportunities to grow the salary side because I mean, I personally would really support that because I think it gives more choices to the employees. You know, if they want to spend some of their money on some of those things, they can, but for those who would prefer to, to, to buy a house or make other choices, then it kind of puts more choices in their hands as opposed to it kind of being made for them up front. But I mean, are those kind of like, strategic choices of where we invest our funds into an eight, into our or organization, is that um, an opportunity for us? That, that we can bring forward that would include how do you balance stuff like that, provide an opportunity to, for employees to choose where they want to put their benefits dollars and stuff. I haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, um, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities out there. We just, we haven't gotten, what we've been focusing right now, at least since I've been here, um, and even with Avo, is is looking at how can we manage um, the the costs in regards to our benefits, uh, you know, and I think we brought some of that stuff forward where, you know, even just putting through the physical therapy program, being able to save a quarter million dollars there, and I mean, I think all that stuff really does add up, which you know, there's still a cost, but looking at how we can, how can we mitigate some of those existential costs until we're able to, to really dig in on some of the other opportunities. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or thoughts at this time? Okay. Karen, thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for your time. All right. The last item is commissioner meeting schedule for 2022. Uh, Lamar Joyner, you want to see us off here? Um, thank you. Um, this is pretty standard. By policy and resolution, um, the board is scheduled to meet every first and third Tuesday of the month. I just want to call attention to a couple of items on that list. Um, in November, uh, the meeting for the first meeting, November the 3rd, um, was set um, by resolution last year. And it was for the, um, in, in reference to the election year and even number of years. I will say that in this um, 2022, that's going to be a little bit different because the elections are set for the first Tuesday after the first Monday. So the election in November will actually be November the 8th. Um, so it's something we didn't take into consideration when we passed that resolution initially. But um, if we want to keep it by um, November the 3rd, we can. So just want to bring uh, attention to that. And the December 5th um, meeting date was set on that first Monday because we have to have an organizational and swearing in meeting is what we typically do on that first Monday. Um, so just want to bring attention. Um, is there any ideas about that November 3rd date? Um, do we want to keep it that date? It will be a Thursday instead of a Tuesday, or do we want to push it back to November the 1st? Which is the first Tuesday of November. I'm sorry. So I'll first Tuesday. Um, we don't. Um, this is just by briefing. I, I was just when we uh, when I bring it back um, for us to approve, it'll be on consent agenda, and I just wanted to get some clarification. So when we do bring it on consent, that it will be clarified in that yeah. document. Does anybody disagree with having it on the first Tuesday? No. Sounds like that's. Yeah. Okay. So on when I bring it back, I will have it state November the first being the first meeting in November. Okay. Sounds like a plan. All right, um, commissioners. I think we've worked through everything on our agenda. So let's adjourn this meeting, and we will reconvene at five o'clock for the regular meeting.